members. Thank you very much. Thank you. Assemblymember Weber, you have item 10, AB 713. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Madam Chair, members of the Education Committee of the Senate, I am here today again to present AB 713, our mandatory kindergarten bill. Um, in 2010, California adopted the Common Core State Curriculum of Standards for K-12, standards that are meant to address the achievement gap and give students the skills and knowledge necessary to be global and critical thinkers. I emphasize that although these standards were done K through 12, kindergarten, to many uh, individual shock, is not a mandatory subject matter in the state of California, even though we have a curriculum that includes kindergarten. The legislature this year, as well as in past years, has made early education a priority. Over the past few years, we have done much to increase the access to uh, preschool programs that develop us academically as well as socially. Uh, 713 caters to parent choice by not changing the compulsory age of education and giving parents the opportunity to choose when their child is ready for kindergarten, whether it be five or six years old. Uh, it also addresses the concerns raised by the opponents in prior bills by adding a section that specifically states that this bill does not stop a parent from applying to homeschool their children instead of enrolling them in a traditional kindergarten program. The focus of this bill is to make kindergarten curriculum mandatory and by making sure that every child has the opportunity to receive the same level of education as their peers in order to maximize the outcome of uh, and in both the short and long-term uh, goals of education. It should be emphasized, and we, wanted, we are continuing to emphasize the fact that there is a curriculum in kindergarten that children should have, they should have access to. And our curriculum is basically interlinked so that it is a, a process where you go from one through K through 12, and every year bill should build on the year prior to that. If we're expecting children as in, kinder, as in first grade to be able to add and subtract in the two, up to the 20s, they have to at least have access to the knowledge of numbers zero to 100. If we're expecting them to be able to do analytical and critical thinking around literature, they should have had exposure to those kinds of skills necessary in kindergarten in terms of the exposure to the material itself. So the oppositions that have been talked about choice for parents we're, asked, we're addressing the issue of choice that parents can continue to basically provide either private school education for their children uh, or choose to put them in at six years if they don't think they're ready at five. They can basically put them at six years into kindergarten. But what we are saying is that before a child is admitted into first grade, they must have exposure and competencies in the K curriculum. And I think that is important if we're talking about closing the achievement gap, if we're talking about zero to eight being a critical period in a child's life in terms of the developing the skills to prevent dropout and all the kinds of things that we talk about academically. So we respectfully ask for your support of this bill. This bill is supported by a number of individuals. It is a bipartisan bill coming out of our house, uh, getting the support not only of, of both parties that are there. It has a number of co-authors on it uh, that support the concept of, of kindergarten curriculum and making it mandatory in the state because we've already basically adopted the K, uh, kindergarten curriculum. It's supported by Teachers Association, California Teachers Association, California State PTA Association, the County Office of Education of San Diego County, and a host of other educators who know that this curriculum is very important and that California needs to require the curriculum for every child in California. We have here today representatives from CTA, Tony Teguero, and Sarah Martin, California's Child Development Administrators Association, who will testify on behalf of the bill. Thank you. In support of the bill, please. Uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chair and members. My name is Sarah Martin, and I'm here on behalf of California Child Development Administrators Association. CCDAA is pleased to support AB 713, which would make kindergarten mandatory in California. CCDAA is a statewide membership organization representing state and federally funded child development and early education agencies across the state of California. Our mission is to ensure that all of California's children have access to high quality child development and early education services. CCDAA was formed 70 years ago during a time when women went to work in the war industries and childcare became a necessity. Since then, we have continued to be a leader in California in supporting early education programs and their leaders, as well as in successfully advocating on behalf of children and their families. The benefits of early childhood education, including kindergarten, help children to succeed in school and in later life. AB 713 will make a significant investment to California's K-12 system that will reap rewards for many years to come. 
Currently, kindergarten enrollment in California is voluntary and children who do not enroll generally lag in terms of achievement levels, oral language development, fine and gross motor skill development, and social emotional development. Kindergarten is one of the first places that children learn how to share and work with peers. Kindergarten teachers involve students in free play and hands-on learning at an age-appropriate level. There are lessons that will build a strong foundation as they move from grade to grade. It is for these reasons that CCDA supports AB 713. Thank you. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, Tony Trigero on behalf of the California Teachers Association. This is the 16th version of mandatory <laughs> kindergarten in the last 16 years. Um, briefly, we, we have included with the author's uh, permission and uh, working with the governor's opt office opt-out language, which he referenced in his veto message last year. It's on page three of your analysis. So we, we're hopeful that this will um, meet with his approval. Um, if not, we will be back year in and year out until we accomplish this fundamental building block that we believe is critical for student success. We ask for your I vote. Thank you very much. Um, in support of the bill. Leah Dara, California State PTA, in support. Thank you. Trudy Schaefer, League of Women Voters of California, in support. Thank you. Ron Rapp, on behalf of the California Federation of Teachers, in support. Thank you. Ray Burnell with the California Catholic Conference, in strong support. Thank you. Kevin Tromer with the Compton Unified School District, in strong support. Thank you. Uh, Nate Mack with the Association of California School Administrators, also in support. Okay, any others in support of the bill? Is there opposition to the bill? Seeing none, are there questions from members? Uh, Senator Vidak. You mentioned the opt-out. I don't see that in my analysis. Can you explain to that? There is language that allows, I think, the um, author reference that allows parents to not participate in that mandatory kindergarten if they so choose in that kindergarten age, that fifth for five-year-old, five-year-olds. So parents can opt out and not be mandatorily involved if, if they so choose. They also have the option of, of basically homeschooling their children with regards to the curriculum itself. And so therefore they can apply to be homeschooled and can be given the curriculum to, to teach their, their children. Uh, one of the things that I think when people say, well, it's mandatory kindergarten, that means you have to go to a public school. It's like we have mandatory instruction. But you don't have to actually go to a public school in order to do it. But you have to evidence that you're being educated, uh, that either you're in a private school or that you're doing homeschooling uh, in the state of California. Even though we require education is compulsory in California, it is not necessary. We often think you have to go to that physical facility to do it. Though you have to engage in the curriculum. You have to know the curriculum, and you have to be able to demonstrate to your uh, school district that you're basically participating. People have the option to not, if you don't, do it, if you don't think they're age appropriate, if you want to do it in sixth grade, that's fine. If you want to homeschool, that's fine. If you want to keep them in a private school that has kindergarten, that's fine. But basically, we want to emphasize the fact that kindergarten is important. It's a curriculum that we should not skip over, that somehow another parents have a responsibility to make sure their children are getting the kindergarten curriculum. My sister's a kindergarten teacher, and I really appreciate that. Um, but what, what, what happens if that wasn't shown to be happening? Is it put a six-year-old then in a kind, kindergarten class because they cannot go to first grade until they go to kindergarten? Yes, there are many six. There are many six-year-olds who actually start kindergarten at six, at six years old, given the the age thing that we have going right. on now. When kids can enter, <laughs> many of our children are going to enter kindergarten at almost age six anyway. Uh, but you have that option. Yes, they would probably go into kindergarten first. If, they had, if they've not been engaged in any kind of educational experience or able to demonstrate it. Uh, if they're like most things in most districts, parents can always challenge anything at a school board if they believe their children can opt out of it. And I'm sure districts may develop some method of doing that in terms of kindergarten. But it is important that we recognize the fact that there is a curriculum and that kids should master that curriculum in kindergarten or master the kindergarten curriculum before they go to first grade because there are expectations in first grade that is built upon. It also emphasizes very strongly to many parents, when I was at one of my schools, I was called there for a reason, to talk to kindergarten parents because, because kindergarten is not required, people don't take it seriously. And so they send their kids to grandma for two weeks or three weeks or whatever. And so that for many districts don't engage in getting kids in, a, as we talk about attendance, truancy, 
Don't get engaged in going after children in kindergarten who are, who are basically truant because it's not required for them to be there. And so kindergarten has one of the highest uh, absentee rates of any of the grade levels because of the fact that it's not required. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Senator Runner, and did you have um, a question? Uh, I guess I have a question because most parents put their kids in kindergarten because they're ready to have a little break there for either that half or full day. Exactly. So is it a real problem that people are not putting their kids in kindergarten? There is, is there's, the a, there's a small percentage of children who don't go to kindergarten. So we're, we're seeing that happening. Um, because it's not required, people are not necessarily going to get that population to come and go. Uh, there's an issue of attendance in terms of students taking mm -hmm. it seriously and basically yes, participating. And um, many of our kids do go to kindergarten. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's important. Uh, and it's interesting in terms of our evolution as a state. Um, last year we had two bills. My, uh, uh, my colleague, Assemblymember Buchanan, and I yeah, co-authored right. two bills together concerning kindergarten. We thought the mandatory would get through and the all-day would not. The all-day got through and the mandatory did not, which is kind of crazy that we would actually look at doing all-day kinder. Uh, as a part of it, and the importance of having children all day in kindergarten because of the because of the the type of curriculum that it provides that requires yeah. more than two or three hours a day, and yet we're not requiring it uh, at the other level. So we're just trying to make sure that this is a line that there is no break in our children's education, uh, that we're not skipping some things and finding children later on struggling in first grade and second grade when their peers have mastered the skills that are necessary. Oftentimes, simple things like motor skills are really important: the ability to hold a pencil use a scissor. Those things are not often looked at as important, but they really are in yes. terms of their physical development and their mental development that's there. We have spent time in the state, educators have, emphasizing the importance of a kid curriculum curriculum, a kindergarten curriculum. And, and it, it seems that we would do that and adopt a curriculum, a common core that really builds on intellectual and critical thinking skills, and then not put a focus and emphasis upon making sure that every child in California knows and a parent that the kindergarten curriculum is important. There are various ways to achieve it, but it is important and it should be included in that K-12 experience. Well, I do agree the curriculum is much different than when I went to kindergarten, um, but uh, also fought for uh, years and years, finally happened with Senator Simidian, uh to move that date back to they have to be at least five right. by September, which I don't know, where the December 2nd ever came in. So I think it's more important that they're older when they start because the curriculum is different. But I don't agree that the parents can't choose to do that. Maybe uh, if they were homeschooled, would they have to use the same curriculum as you use in kindergarten? They would be, they would be provided with the kindergarten curriculum, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean you can't expand it. I mean, I have nieces, a niece right. homeschooled oh, sure. all of her children. She uses the base, the base curriculum, but she's not limited to that. Mm -hmm. She can expand it in any way possible. But at least she demonstrates every year. She was in California, now she's in Utah, uh, or um, Colorado, demonstrates every year that her children have mastered the material. Yes. That's important. And, and her kids are very competitive, so mm -hmm. it's not that she's just off on her own uh, and not being responsible with regards to what the expectations are for the state of Colorado for her children. Okay. I just have a problem with it being mandated and parents not making their own decisions and... Do you have a problem with K-12 being mandated, period? No. Oh. <laughs> First grade through 12th grade, yeah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. But, we uh, often talk about things, mandating education, and right. uh, we have responsibility as a state to make sure our children are prepared. Sure. And, and, uh, and again, I think the curriculum is much different than it was, and that's why I believe that children should start later, because when we had year-round school in my district, there were kids that were four and a half starting in July. Sure. And that's where by first and second grade you see they have multiple serious special ed needs where really they were just probably too immature when they started, but the needs seem to be uh, dramatized or, or uh, expanded when they get to first or second grade and they continue in that younger, haven't quite got the maturity and uh, the curriculum under well, their Well, the belt, good thing so. with this bill as well with their K-12 curriculum period is that parents still have various choices and options about the entrance of kids into kindergarten. Mm -hmm. They can do it at five, they can do it at six, mm -hmm. and it's the and individual parents generally know the maturity that's there. Uh, I have a grandchild, my mother, my daughter is furious that he's going to almost be six when he goes to kindergarten. Yes. Uh, she thinks he's ready at three uh, <laughs> and yes. so, as a result. So you end up with a wide range. Of, of abilities and, and challenges and choices 
uh, that's there. So giving the parents a five to six option, uh, we think, is a reasonable option in this bill and addresses many of the concerns. Are they ready or not ready for kindergarten? We give them that option. We also give them the option of homeschooling. And, uh, but one of the things we don't give them an option of is believing that kindergarten is not mandatory and necessary. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, any other comments or questions? Uh, Senator Mendoza. First of all, I want to thank the author for bringing this forward. Um, I taught for 10 years at elementary school. I taught first grade for three years. Um, you know, I, first of all, I, I do think it should be mandatory. I mean, now you hear... Uh, they want to help hold teachers accountable for the way the kids are testing and so forth, and you have all this accountability going on, but yet, you know, the, the, the way we prepare our students uh, early on really makes a difference. I remember when I taught those years in first grade, I knew which kids went to preschool and which ones did not. It was, right, it was very evident. And to those kids that don't go to kindergarten, it was just even worse. And those kids end up going to kindergarten at such a, uh, if they're six years old, Sometimes those kids uh, get stigmatized as they, you, you, I, either you flunked or you're like not good enough and it's not even the case. They're just not as prepared as they should be when they're so young. And these kids are, at the younger age, they learn fast and they catch on. And it's, an, it's, it's, a, it's a missed opportunity if we don't educate these kids at a very young age. And I do think that this bill is very necessary. Uh, for many years, I, I have always said, wow, do you, do you, I, I astonish parents and people when they tell them that kindergarten is not mandatory. They're like, what? How could it not be? You know, and we're pushing for more preschool, but yet kindergarten is not mandatory. But yes, it's long overdue. I'm very happy that you bring it forward, and I'm, I move the bill if it hasn't been moved yet. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Any other comments from members? Um, quick question here. I'm in support of uh, what the bill is trying to do, but I, we have been looking. Think, thank goodness the bill is only four pages long, but we can't find any opt-out language in it. So. Uh, need a clarification here. Okay. All right. So the bill has been moved. Um, please call the roll. Do pass to appropriations. Lou? Aye. Lou, aye. Runner? No. Runner, no. Block? Aye. Block, I Hancock? Aye. Hancock, I Leva? Aye. Leva, I Mendoza? Aye. Mendoza, I Monning? Aye. Monning, I Pan? Vidak? No. Vidak, no. 6-2. Six, 6-2. Two. Six, two, the bill is out. We'll keep the roll open for our Thank absent members. Much, Thank you very I much. Um, Assembly Member Frazier, you have one bill, item 20, AB 1369. Welcome. Okay. All right. What's the? Oh, oh, number seven. Okay. You want to add on? We'll open the roll. We'll open the roll to. Um, oh, that's right. Okay, you're moving the bill. Thank you. Call the absent members. Okay, AB two nine two. Do pass to appropriations. Lou? Aye. Lou, aye. Runner? No. Runner, no. Block? Aye. Block, I Hancock? Aye. Hancock, I Leva? Aye. Mendoza? Aye. Mendoza, I Monning? Aye. Monning, I Pan? Vidak? No. Vidak, no. That's 5-2. Five 5-2. Two. Five two, um, we'll keep the roll open for absent members. Thank you. Now to get back on track. Uh, Assemblymember Frazier, you have a special education bill. Please present. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senators. AB 1369 seeks to ensure that our schools offer students with dyslexia the appropriate remediation before they fall behind in their academic achievement. The International Dyslexia Association estimates that as many as 15 to 20 percent of the population has some of the symptoms of dyslexia, including slow or inaccurate reading, poor spelling, poor writing, or mixing up similar words. Although dyslexia is one condition listed in the federal and state definition of a specific learning disability, and federal law states that a specific learning disability is a disorder in a uh, psychological oh, process, no, no, no. it does not include a phonological process, uh, processing deficit, uh, which is a hallmark of dyslexia. When school districts review assessment data for a given student, 
School personnel look for visual and auditory processing deficits, but often ignore evidence of phonological deficits because visual and auditory deficits are specified in the above definition. This bill further addresses the need for an evidence-based, multi-sensory, direct, explicit, structured, and sequential approach to remediating students with dyslexia by requiring the uh, superintendent of public instruction to develop such program guidelines. Testifying in support of the bill is Dr. Kelly Sandman Hurley with the Dyslexia Training Institute, classroom teacher Holly Snyder, and my hero student Max Matheny uh, here today. And I respectfully ask for your support on behalf of the 5,500 parents statewide who have voiced their strong support for this bill. Thank you very much. In support of the bill. Hello, uh, my name is Dr. Kelly Sandman Hurley, and I am here in support of AB 1369. I'm also here on behalf of the 20% of California students who have dyslexia, so that's one in five children. We are hopeful that your consideration of the addition of the phonological processing choice into the IEP process and the addition of the description of what we know to be an effective intervention for those with dyslexia, which is an evidence-based, multi-sensory, direct, explicit, structured, and sequential approach, will be the beginning of an appropriate education for every student with dyslexia. Currently, the law states that a child qualifies for special education if they have an identified auditory or visual processing disorder. However, many students are missed and not qualified for services because dyslexia is, not a, phonological pro is a phonological processing disorder, not auditory or visual. Therefore, adding phonological processing to the list of processing disorders would allow those students who have difficulty reading and spelling due to phonological processing is issues would receive the services and the accommodations that they, which are appropriate. Currently, the California Ed Code encourages districts to use an appropriate program for a student with dyslexia or sus suspected dyslexia. However, individual districts have failed to put that encouragement into action. For children with dyslexia to be the successful students and citizens, citizens that they are quite capable of becoming, schools have the responsibility to use the intervention that research has shown time and again is effective. And in the case of dyslexia, this means the intervention that is evidence-based, multi-sensory, direct, explicit, structured, sequential. The description of this intervention is paramount to the success of this bill. If this particular language is removed from the bill, nothing will have changed. The description of the intervention will assure that the programs that districts choose are based in evidence for children with dyslexia. Without the language, districts will be free to implement the eclectic and unstructured programs they currently use that have been shown time and again not to work for these children. Over the last 15 to 20 years, neuroscience has identified this type of intervention that is effective for students with dyslexia. Research, researchers have shown that this intervention is successful in strength, strengthening the neural pathways that a student needs to improve their reading and writing. And again, it's the, the multi-sensory explicit systematic investigation of the structure of the English language, which is implemented by someone trained not only in the strategies of this type of intervention, but who understands why they need this intervention. And this is not new information. This information has been around for 15 to 20 years and nothing has been done with it. Um, our concern is that these bright children, like we have here today, are marginalized despite the vast amount of research that is available to responsible educators. They are held back and asked to change when the instruction is what needs to change. They are denied their potential due to school's continued lack of education in the area of dyslexia. When 20% of a school district struggles to read and spell because of dyslexia and the public education community refuses to respond with an appropriate intervention and early identification, they fail to provide FAPE on a regular basis. And we'll just leave you with a thought from Dr. Sally Shaywitz, who states, when it comes to dyslexia, we do not have a knowledge gap, we have an action gap. Okay, thank you. In support. Good morning, my name is Holly Snyder, and I'm both a kindergarten teacher of 12 years and a mom of a nine-year-old boy with dyslexia. Despite the fact that I am an experienced and effective teacher, I didn't discover my own son's dyslexia until he was in second grade. I didn't recognize it, not because he didn't struggle long before then, but because I wasn't trained to recognize it or how to remediate it. Not only in my lack of knowledge had I failed my own son, but also the many dyslexic children that have moved through my classroom without proper interventions put in place. The systematic misconception of dyslexia is widespread. It begins in the College of Education and spreads as far as our United States Congress. It is the gross misinterpretation of dyslexia that makes AB 1369 in its entirety so important. We know what it is, how to identify it, and how to offer effective reading instruction to those who have it. We know that adding phonological deficit to the definition of a specific learning disability will help to identify students with dyslexia sooner, providing them with critical early intervention. 
identification alone is not enough. Research shows us that using an evidence-based, multi-sensory, direct, explicit, structured, and sequential approach to instructing children with dyslexia can and will help close the gap for our struggling readers, but schools are not using it. Borrowing an analogy from our Decoding Dyslexia OIO friends, if you went to a doctor with strep throat but the doctor told you to simply take a vitamin because that's all they had, this would be negligence, medical malpractice. This is what is happening in our schools to our dyslexic children. We know how to treat it, but schools offer what they have instead of what we know works. Simply put, this is educational malpractice and it is robbing our dyslexic students of a free and appropriate education. The impact of this is devastating to our students and to our society. Many of the people who represent AB 1369 today have had the painful experience of sitting at an IEP table and having to fight for our children. We have had to use the money from our own pockets, thousands of dollars, to seek a diagnosis, obtain lawyers, or pay for outside tutoring. We represent a very small portion of the dyslexic children in this state. What about those students who never learn to read, those who will eventually give up and drop out of school? This creates an economic and social disaster that is preventable. The cost savings of the few families paying for outside help is nothing compared to the expense of letting down a group of people who we know make up a large portion of our most creative leaders. Dyslexia should not prevent anyone from meeting their full potential. We cannot afford to continue to turn our backs on 20% of our society. I'll leave you with a statement from Dr. Louisa Motes. In medicine, if research found new ways to save lives, healthcare professionals would adopt these methods as quickly as possible and would change practices, procedures, and systems. Educational research has found new ways to save young minds by helping them become proficient readers. It is up to us to promote these new methods throughout the education system. Young lives depend on it. Please join me in supporting our dyslexic children and AB 1369. Thank you very much. Welcome. Hi, my name is Max Matheny. I'm severely dyslexic. I am 13 going into the eighth grade. I'm really smart with an IQ higher than average. I have been in special ed since the first grade. In the fourth grade, I was moved in a special day class and have spent the last four years there. My school is now saying that I did not belong in that class. The problem with being in special day class is that I did not receive the correct evidence-based teaching method so that I could learn how to read. So now there is a four-year gap between where I am at and where I could be with my education. Up until this past January, I read at a second grade level. At the beginning of this year, my mom advocated for the school to provide me the correct multi-sensory reading instructions. In four months, I went from a second grade reading to a 3.5 reading level. I think that most teachers don't understand kids like me. Teachers need to learn about dyslexia and multi-sensory programs. That helps us learn to read. I'm glad they are teaching me now. I had given up hope before. I just thought I was too stupid to learn how to read. I'm lucky because I have family and friends that help me, and I'm very thankful for that. But some kids don't have support like I do, and nobody is helping them. That's why I'm here. I hope that you will hear my story and use it to help other kids like me. Thank you. Thank you very much.